So this will be the last lecture of what we call magnetostatics, or the study of magnetic fields that are not changing in time um, and are therefore constant. And in order to complete this concept of magnetostatics, we're going to introduce the idea of induction, which is going to be the magnetic field equivalent of capacitance. And we're going to introduce magnetostatic energy, which is a notion that energy is stored in magnetic fields just as they were in electric fields. So let's take a look. Uh, this lecture is divided up into three pieces. The first, we're gonna talk about what we mean by magnetic flux and use that to build up inductance. In part two, we'll review how to calculate inductance, although the emphasis is not exactly on how you solve integrals. Um, and in part three, uh, we're gonna talk about the notion of magnetostatic energy or stored energy in magnetic fields. So starting off with magnetic flux and inductance. Uh, now I wanna contrast by starting out with the idea of capacitance, right? Capacitance was the electric field way of relating sources to um, potential, right? And so we had this notion of a capacitor, like two parallel plates, for example. And if there is a charge plus Q on one plate and minus Q on the other, and we've got a voltage difference V between these two plates, then there is a, a something called capacitance, which simply linearly relates those. And it relates to each other via Q equals CV. C is called capacitance. And C was strictly a function of the geometry, how big your plates are, how far apart they are, what kind of material fills the space between the plates. All that went into this factor C that we call capacitance. Uh, now we're expecting magnetic fields to somehow relate to this or to have a similar form. The challenge is that we started off with this idea of Q, electric charge, and we know there's no such thing as magnetic charge. So we're not quite gonna be able to, to correspond this, but there is kind of a trick to get sort of the equivalent of electric charge. And that is to take the electric flux density D, which has units of coulombs, per meter squared. And if we can somehow integrate it as a function of area, then we're going to get um, something that's equivalent to the amount of sources that are present. And, and that's basically the, um, the, the idea of Gauss's law. Uh, so it sort of gave us this perspective that if we take the integral of D around the surface, across a surface, then uh, that's going to tell us something about charge. So we sort of have a proxy if we can take uh, electric flux density and integrated over an area, it's a proxy for charge. And we're gonna have to do something pretty similar with, uh, with, uh, with, with magnetic flux lines. In particular, uh, if we take the integral of B and B is magnetic flux density as opposed to D, which is electric flux density, and we dot it with some surface, that's gonna be sort of connected to a source. I don't know if you remember when we introduced B, B had units of uh, Weber's per meter squared, right? A, a Weber is a non-existent entity um, that corresponds to magnetic charge. And even though there's no such thing as magnetic charge, if it did exist, we already have the units for it. Um, so this kind of looks a little bit like um, D, except we just swapped out the type of charge. So we're gonna have to introduce this idea of magnetic flux. And magnetic flux will simply be if I have some surface and around that surface, I'm gonna define the vector ds as basically pointing perpendicular to the surface and having a small piece of area. So for example, ds would, would uh, have the following. It could be, for example, dx times dy pointed in the z direction. And if we sort of integrate this and take the value of B and take the dot product with this DS vector and add up all those little contributions of B dot DS, it's gonna give us a measure of the total magnetic flux. This should make sense because uh, B we call the magnetic flux density. And so when we integrate it over an area, we're taking the density and converting it into a total. So that's the total magnetic flux. Um, we're gonna call this uh, a capital phi, and that's gonna correspond to what we call magnetic flux. 
all right? And so now that we have this sort of proxy, this way to get at something like the sources of magnetic field without actually talking about magnetic charge, then we can, we can sort of create this notion of um, inductance in a pretty simple form. It's simply going to be that phi, right? That's the equivalent of Q, is phi equals L, L being the equivalent of capacitance times I, the current, right? So that's gonna be sort of the equivalent of Q equals CV, except for magnetic fields, right? These are analogous to each other. And L is called the inductance. And it will in general have units of Henry or capital H. And I is the current that we are running. So th the notion is that we are creating, we are starting off with some uh, current that we are running. That current may run in a circle. And as a result of that current, we are creating magnetic field lines. So this is uh, the current right here, I. And we're creating magnetic field lines that are going to be passing through in between these currents. And that's how we're going to relate um, the, uh, uh, the, the fields, the fluxes. And the total flux is passing through, that's what we're calling phi. It's a, it's a total of all of these magnetic field lines integrated through the area inside of these, um, uh, these loops right here. So this is how we're gonna define inductance. In the next video, we're gonna talk about how we calculate inductance in practicality.